Okay. We're on the bottom of page 13, but we're going to turn over in a second. Today's class, we are going to discuss the transition from individual prayer and how it became communal prayer and how the Siddur became part of that and why we have to pray in Hebrew or if we have to pray in Hebrew. That will be today's discussion. God willing, there's a lot to talk about. A lot of Rambams. Um, so up to now, as the Rambam's going to tell us, prayer worked any way you wanted it to work. Historically, Adam Rishon, we said, prayed. We said Avram Vinu prayed, and Yisra and Yaakov, and they all prayed. But And the Imad prayed, we said, right? Sarukha, Rachel, Vaseya, Leah, they all prayed, but they prayed how they wanted, when they wanted, whatever they wanted to say, they said. And this carried on for everyone for a long time. But at some point in Jewish history, things changed. Things changed to include individual prayer did not go away. This is the mistake that many people make. Individual prayer did not go away, but in came something called communal prayer. And communal prayer did not come to replace it. It came to enhance it because something bad happened. Something bad happened. And because that something bad happened, we needed to have a communal form of prayer. Okay? Of which the Siddur is just the, the Seder, the order. The word Siddur, because the word Seder is the order of the prayers. Let's see the Rambam. That's going to be today's class. There's a lot to discuss. It's a historical class. Let's look at the words of the Rambam in Hilchot Tefillah, in the Laws of Prayer, chapter 1, verse 1. We're on page 14 now. And he, gave, he gives us a nice, short, condensed history of prayer. And he says, V'en minna tefillah minna Torah. The number of prayers is not decreed in the Torah. V'en uh, mishnah tefillah is not decreed by Torah law. And the wording is not minna Torah. V'en le tefillah zman kavu minna Torah. And when to pray is not from the Torah. We said, according to the Torah, you have to pray. That's it. When, where, how, how long, how little, where, totally up to you. On a Doraisa level, on a Torah level, on a Doraisa level. Okay. Any form of prayer. And he says, the way it used to be, Imaya Ragil, if a person was fluent, Marbab Trina or Bakasha, he would, or she would, just say whatever they want, make as many supplications, as many requests. Right? If you're a good prayer and you knew how to pray and you were part of your life, how did it used to work? You would stand for as long as you wanted. An hour, two hours, five hours, who knows? Okay. However, Vimaya Aras of a time, if you had a borrowed expression, blocked, blocked lips, i.e. it was difficult for you to pray, but then you would pray as little as you want. Right? And at a time that you wanted as well. So it was kind of like up to the individual. That's the way it always was for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's how prayer was, says the Rambam. And the number of prayers that a person would pray also depended upon their ability. There were some people who prayed once a day. Many people prayed all day. It was just like they were just good prayers. But everybody prayed facing the direction of the temple in Jerusalem from wherever they stood. Okay? Everyone faced Rishalayim. Everyone faced. This was the practice, says the Rambam, interestingly. From Moshe at Ezra. Until Ezra, who Ezra was seen a second. But when Ezra turned up the scene, he was metakini, made a takana, time of the second temple, that things have to change. Things can have to change because this individual prayer thing is not working the way it should. Too many people, why we'll see in a second, but too many people were not fluent in Hebrew, were not fluent in prayer, didn't know what to say, didn't have anything of substance to add to their tefillot, and it was detrimental to them and the Jewish people. What happened? So he says, I'll tell you what happened. 
we know that the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, in particular Nebuchadnezzar, top page 15. Nebuchadnezzar Harasha, the evil Nebuchadnezzar. What happened was that the Jewish people were exiled. We went into Galut. Nitarabu Baparas, the Yavan. We got mixed up into Paras, into Great Neck, into Yavan, into Greece, Bishamot, and the other nations. So we all got exiled at that time. Well, what happens when you're in exile? Well, you have kids. And your kids are not as fluent in the Mamaloshan, in the original language, that your parents or the parents are. For Naldulahem Banim, and their children, Baratzot, Hagoyim, in these non-Jewish nations, because of the destruction of the first temple, there was like a, a mix-up. People were just not good. They just didn't know what to say. They didn't read Hebrew. I mean, look at it today in America, you know. They came from the old country. Whoever came from the old country, knew Hebrew, for the most part was religious, knew how to pray. Their kids, yeah. Their grandkids, like, you know. Hebrew's lost, the fillers lost, it's all gone. Right, it's the same thing. This is really the first major occasion this happened in world history. Right. Everyone used to have one language. Everyone was, was able to clearly express themselves in one language. Right. They became unable to express themselves properly in one language. Hebrew was lost, as we see to this day. I mean, how many Jewish people read Hebrew today? What percentage? I'll say the majority do not know how to read Hebrew. That would be my guess, at least here in America. I mean, I mean, the Chus Laaretz, for sure. Yeah. He carries on, says the Rambam. They weren't able to speak Hebrew, right? Uh, as their national, uh, their new national tongue. When they started to pray, they started to abbreviate their prayers. Right? What a person used to do in like three hours, right? Or one hour. Those are a couple of moments and that was it. That was it. Right? Whether they were asking for stuff was very short or they were praising God. It was very short. It wasn't a substantial enough prayer. Right? Because they were stuck in Galut. They didn't know what to say, how to say it. Right? Their grandparents came from the old country. No one knew what they were saying. They were learning new language and they were lost. Okay. And he says to the extent that they were mixed up in these foreign languages, right, they started to mix these foreign languages into their tefillot. So Ezra comes along. He's now in the second temple. Or Beit Dino and his Beit Din. They said, you know what? This is not working. We're going to fix up a set order of prayers. That's what we're going to do. Because it's not working. So we're going to put and create the tracks that are needed to place the train of tefillah that everyone is going to have to say. Right? Man, everyone's going to have to say this. And we're going to put it al haseder according to the Seder. Hence the word, Sidur, the order. And they said, you know what? The Amida is the main prayer, obviously. And they divide into three sections. Does anyone remember what the three sections of tefillah are? We discussed them last class. Shevach Lashem. The last three were Hoda Lashem, to give thanks to Hashem. And the middle section that you needed. That is the perfect structure within which a person can fulfill everything they need to in order of their prayers. Individual concerns, collective concerns, everything you need to say, he says, is in there. Is this the best way to pray? Well, nowadays, maybe it is. Historically, was it? No. Historically, that, this, was like, this was plan B. The Siddur, the order to fill out, it's all plan B, said the Rambam. Everyone could say the right thing. If people wanted to add, they could. But this was the basic 
bare bone structure for tefillah. V'lamdu otam v'tia tefillah elu ha'elga tefillah shleima ketafle ketfilot ba'alei haloshon hatzacha. Whether you didn't read or did read and you knew what to say, you know what to say, don't worry about it. Read this, you're good to go. Read this, you're good to go. This is your, you know, this is the cliff notes. Right? It's all there. Maybe we don't have the cliff notes. Maybe this is the full version, you know? And because of this, they were actually ended up being attacking all the brachot. But Philip Mesurot Bafi called it for everyone to say, Kadeshio Inyan called bracha a ruch according to the clarity that a person was able to say it. Okay. That's the way it happened. It's a historical necessity that we had to move from individual, only individual, to filot, which has not disappeared. We still have to do that. Remember, the Rambam says, when a person's in need, in distress, the Gemara says, their back hurts them. You pray, you got a bad foot, you made a pray to Hashem for that. Now, foot hurting is not in the tefillah. Okay, there is Rafa'enu, Hashem heal us. It may fall into that, but a person's also meant to pray for their individual, personal needs. But that's not now. Now we're saying, you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to pray. That's what they're saying. I don't care if you're the biggest Torah scholar in the entire world. I don't care if you're a six-year-old in, in, in yeshiva, right? I don't care. Everyone among the Jewish people says the same to fill up. I mean, there's other benefits that come with this. It means that I can go to a synagogue in Russia, in France, in Kabul, not that I'm planning on it, or anywhere else in the world, and I don't speak their language, which they speak fluently, but we have a universal language of prayer that we can say together. That's a benefit that comes with it. And those people who travel around the world, right, besides just speaking Hebrew, just at least to pray with the community in their language brings a unity as well. That's obviously part of the Cheshba. Okay. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch explains this in more poetic language. Page 15, note 4. He says, you know, when Israel dwelt on its land, he's basically rephrasing the Rambam and updating it. Life everywhere clearly appeared as being born by God. Everything was very good. We had God there. We had Eris Yisrael. We had the Beit Migdash. It was all good. But Israel stood before a long period of wandering, scattered, and despised among the nations. Right, we went into Galut. Robbed of all national character. Hardly admitted to possess human character. Having but Torah and the spirit of Torah as our only possession. A crushing of the spirit under torture, worldly troubles, was to be foreseen. So he's saying that Ezra knew this was going to happen. I mean, Abravini knew Galut was coming. But he was seeing one of the impacts that comes with being exiled. And one of the impacts is people just feel bad. We're crushed. We forget Hebrew. We forget God. We forget the Beit HaMikdash. We're so disconnected from everything that we're in a bad place. Galut doesn't just mean we forget Hebrew. We forget all the good stuff. We forget what it means to be Jewish. We forget to marry Jewish. A substitute had to be found for the Beit HaMikdash, says Rabbi Hirsch. Not only were we kicked out to get Hebrew, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash anymore. So what is going to replace the Beit HaMikdash? Okay. And all the spiritual levers that spring from it. So he says, Ezra and the Anshay Knesset Adola, Ezra and the Anshay Knesset Adola, the great assembly, they set up this divine service. That there were prophets among believers. It wasn't just ordinary people. The Anshay Knesset Adola were Nevi'im. They were prophets. What they set up wasn't just like a nice technical order of things to say. They were saying, this is everything you need to say. And they got this through Nevoah, through prophecy. So the prayer we have is from a very, very great place. And they made it into a firm form. They compiled it among the Israel's book of prayer. He calls it the Siddur. That is Israel's book of prayer. Okay? That's the way it was set up. And this present day text says Rabbi Shab, Shua, by the way, one of the best books on prayer out there today, as far as I'm concerned, which is in English, is Rabbi Shimon Schwab's book on Tefillah, on prayer. It's a thick book. You have to read all of it, even bits of it. I've read parts of it. It is a fantastic book, one of the best books on to fill it out today. Rav Schwab was a uh, refugee from Germany. 
before the Second World War. He lived in Washington Heights, wrote and spoke a vast amount, became the rabbi of KJ. So his book is one of the best ones. So he says, this text that we have is referred to as Matbeah Shetavu Chachamim. It is the, the coin, right? The coin formula of our sages, right? Just like a coin has an imprint on it, so too the prayer is an imprint of our Chachamim, of our sages. And it started with the men of the great assembly. So it's rabbinic. We know that. The Ramam says it's rabbinic. No one disagrees with that. This includes the order of prayer, it includes the Amida, and it includes Kaddish, it includes Baruchu, it includes Kedusha, the Amida, Kimuru prayer, Brachot, Kiddush, Abdallah. All of that was fixed and set by the Anshe Knesset HaGadol. So that's the text itself, and that's the way it was formulated. Okay, once again, it wasn't stumped. There are references, there are ideas in there, there's deep, I mean, I have a Siddur that talks about the Kabbalistic understandings of tefillah, right? There's a, a much deeper understanding than what we read. It's amazing. You have one thing that a five-year-old can read and get something out of, hopefully, and something a 95-year-old can read and get something out of the same tefillah. Page 16. Okay, so that's the text itself, and that's what itself. Now, we're going to revisit those texts in more detail to see the, the uncut, the depth that comes with it. But how about the time? Because... We already said that a person could pray what they wanted, so that changed, and when they wanted. So where did this whole time thing turn up? That we have a morning, and we have an afternoon, and we have an evening now. Already we saw reference to it with the Avot. We saw that the Avot prayed Avram in the morning, Yitzchak in the afternoon, Sirach and Yaakov at night time. But when did that become like established for all of us? So the Rambam continues, and he says that it's reflective of the korbanot, of the sacrifice times and events that happened in the Beit HaMikdash. So the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, and we're going to start to copy and mention them a lot more. And the Rambam says like this, V'chein, teknoshia minat tefillot kuminyan ha-korbanot. The Great Assembly also established that the number of tefillot would correspond to the number of times the daily sacrifices were offered in the Beit HaMikdash. So one reflects the other. They brought a morning sacrifice, there's a morning sacrifice. There's an afternoon sacrifice called a mincha, then we have that tefillah as well. Then we have the musaf sacrifice. That's the third tefillah. The three tefillot are shacharit, shachar korban, the mincha, mincha korban, and the musaf that was brought on Shabbat and Jewish holidays. So we have tefillah to reflect that. Oh, what about the nighttime service? Where did that come from? Says the Rambam, Or tefillah she can neget tamid shel boker, he nekret tefillah shachar. Tefillah she can neget tamid shel ben arbaim, the afternoon sacrifice, nekret tefillah mincha. Right, the afternoon arbaim is between the evening, that's when the sun is at its apex to when it goes by the horizon. That's the afternoon prayer. So we have when sun, it goes with the sun. Sun rises, reaches its top, that's shacharit. It's at the top, and then it goes behind the horizon, that's mincha. Musaf can be prayed during any of those times. Any of those times. And then he says, the sacrifices of the morning and afternoon weren't always completely consumed. They weren't always completely consumed, he says. This is note two. Okay. There's an evening prayer, which is not the same level as the first two. Shachar and Mincha are just more important than the evening service. Because they come to correspond to actual korbanot. But the Marif, what we call the Arvit service, that he says a tefillah shalayla, this is because sometimes the afternoon sacrifice wouldn't be completely consumed, there are bits left over, and at night time, so that they were all consumed by the morning, they were thrown into a big pile, and they would just like burn them up. So it's not its own sacrifice, it's kind of like the ruin. This is why it's a much shorter tefillah, and there's no chazara, there's no repetition of the ma'ariv prayer. Okay? And that stayed lit the entire night, which is why you can say arvit, ma'ariv, the entire night as well. So we have four prayer times now. We have shacharit, connected to the shacharit sacrifice. 
the afternoon, regular tamid, right, the mincha sacrifice. Then we have Musaf, Jewish holidays, which is going to be reflective of the korban for that holiday, and will include inside it all the information about that holiday. And then you have something, the fourth one, which was basically the night time when they would burn up the extra, which wasn't its own sacrifice, just the extra and leftovers. So those are our times. So now we have what? Sidor, we have why. People forgetting Hebrew, people were forgetting Yerushalayim and the Beit HaMikdash. We have when, morning, afternoon, Musaf, and evening. But how about how many? That also changed. That also changed. It used to be that a person could pray by themselves. They would have their own personal tefillah as an individual, right? We know, remember the story of Yaakov, uh, sorry, Yitzchak and Rivka were praying for children. Yitzchak did not go find a minion. He wouldn't have found one. So what did he do? And what does she do? Rivka went into one corner of the room. Yitzchak went into the other corner of the room. And they prayed. And what do they pray for? Having children. One of the most powerful and important philot of Jewish women. To have children, to have healthy children, to bring up your children, this is men as well. Right? But women specifically seem to tend more towards that. We see from the Imaot. Right? Although Yaakov, uh, Yitzchak prayed for children as well. Right? But there's a different emphasis. When a woman prays and a man prays, when any individual prays, there's a different influence that goes with it. So what's up with communal prayer? Right? Why did that become important? And who did it become important for? Who did it become important for? for? And this has become an area of much, much debate. And unfortunately, through a misunderstanding of it, controversy over the years. Who is obligated in Minyan? Why they're obligated? So first of all, it's rabbinic. Right? Because people used to pray by themselves. And people should still pray by themselves. And that seems to be the main way that tefillah existed and still exists. However, things changed. And the Rambam says, you know, Maybe we were at the level, he doesn't say this, but I'm going to imply this from his words. Maybe we were at the level, going back hundreds of years, thousands of years, that one person's prayer could change the entire world. Ah, Ravina prayed, things happened. Yitzchak prayed, big things happened. Sarah Menu prayed, woo, big things happened. Right? Major events occurred. People became well from it. We see evidence of it. Right? People were cured of diseases, and this carried on. Right? David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech, they were praying and big things occurred. Hannah prayed by herself and big, big things happened. But there's something called Yerido Tadorot, which literally means the coming down of the generations. We start up here and then we go down. We're further away from the temple by generations. We're further away from Har Sinai. We're further away, I mean, even be honest, right? Think about your grand, I've seen that grandmothers pray? Yeah. Have you seen an old Sephardi woman pray at the Kotel? Is any, anything more real than that event? Have you seen more concentration, more contemplation? You look at like, what? Well, how do they do that? How do they? Right? They say to heal him in the books, right? If not your grandma, I'm, I'm assuming your grandmother. I say Sephardi because every Sephardi grandmother is like a professional at prayer. You know? Definitely your great grandmother. And the Sefer Tehillim is open, and the pages are worn, and the, bent. the Siddur should not be nice and pristine, right? It should be bent, it should be brown, you know? It should have stains of tears on them, you know? That's a real Siddur. It should be a worn-out book, you know? My mother actually gave me a set of Mahzorm for my grandfather, actually gave me a Haggadah as well. It's covered in wine stains, you know? It's covered in... Book. It's all... That's the way it should look. Your siddur should not look nice and clean and pretty. Right? Your chumash can look like that. That can be nice, clean and pretty. Your siddur should not be like that. It should be mangled, it should be pulled and twisted. Well, not literally. But that's, that's the way it should That's the way it should be. And that's the way, like, our, even like going back three, four generations, we look at our grand, the way they pray, like, wow. That's like, that's amazing. That's like two, three generations. 
Can you imagine 10 generations? Imagine 30? Imagine 80? Imagine how they were praying back then? One person said something, big events happened. But not that level. But not that level. Right? I don't pray as well as my father. I see my father, but like, I'm not praying like that. Right? The level of concentration, the thought, and the amount of time. Right? It's just you read it the door road. It's not an excuse, it's a reality. Is that because we're straying so far? It's a number of things. It's the it's galut in general, right? It's where we are in history, what's happened to us. I can't speak for everyone, I'm speaking for myself, but you see it. But if it's a generational thing, like. It's a generational thing. It's a read the it's a generational thing. Each generation is seen since we're far away from Adam and Rishon and from Har Sinai, Beit Migdash. Each generation is like a photocopy. The first it? copy is perfect, second one is a little bit weaker, then eventually you end up like 15 copies later, it's like, you better read it. But how do you, how do we expect to like, obtain? That's a very, very fair question. Yeah. It's another question. Less is expected from us, to be honest with you. That's what Desla says, and the Chavis Chaim says as well. So we're less, is so le less is expected of us since we're further away. It's just the truth. Otherwise, we'd be in big trouble. We'd be in big trouble. There's also, though, there's also, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to prayer, there is also a cumulative effect. Now, we mentioned this already in a previous class. But since you mentioned I'll, I'll go into it a little bit right now. Since we're talking about tefillot of the avot. When you pray, unlike other mitzvot where you're on your own, when you pray, you're coming with a cumulative effect from generations before. They, they talk about this. They say, you know, we're doing well now. You, you know, you did something great in your life. You became great because your grandmother prayed for you. They don't say because your grandfather, you know, shook a lull of you. It doesn't say that. Prayer is cumulative. I'll give you an analogy I heard for this. I don't know if it's written anywhere, but someone told it to me. It stayed in my head. I actually printed it in my first book because it works so nicely. You see this by the Kotel. I mean, the Western Wall. The Kotel, where we pray, is the perfect metaphor itself for prayer. So think of the Kotel. The Kotel is made up, right, of these, like, bricks that come down like this, yeah? And then you like, like that, like that, yeah, you with me? And then you end up right over here, and you come like that, and like that, and like that, and up over here like that, and like that, and like that, and then you end up like that, and you, right? That, that's my depiction of the Kotel. I failed art, in case you're wondering, okay? So if you go down the Kotel tunnels, you have like 500 ton stones, right? And then you go up a little bit, look up, and there's like a smaller stone. It's like 100 tons. Then you go up a little, you know this analogy before? It's very cool this. You go up a little bit more, and then you go up on the plaza, right, where the Western Wall stands today, and there's like smaller stones. I don't know, like half a ton. And then you look up at the top, and suddenly you get these tiny little stones on top. Nachon? It's true, right? You can hold them in one hand. Right? This is the perfect metaphor for prayer. You see, when you stand praying and you say something, there ain't too much you got to rely on. Just yourself. But do not panic. Because prayer is a cumulative reality. We are standing on the backs of our abot. Right. There were the great stones at the bottom. They had big to fill up. They had to fill up were tons. The next generation comes along. This is 50 tons. But don't worry, there was 500 tons before. So now you're worth 550. And then you come like 100 tons, right? Or 10 tons. You get 10, you get 50, you get 500. And then the higher you go, you end up with like 100 pounds. Don't worry. You're not in alone. It comes from the back. It's a filler, as we said. Say the Chachamim is something that is cumulative in nature. You're not in alone. If you were in alone, we'd be in big, 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 big trouble. So we stand at the Kotel. You can remember that idea. Okay. So communal prayer, in order to somehow make up what was lost with individual prayer, we assume the individual prayer was enough, come along the sages, the Chachamim, Ezra, and they said, no, no, no. We're going to have to create something called Minyan. Interestingly, women are not obligated in Minyan. Women are not obligated. Which means, contrary to what you hear many people saying, oh, the women aren't important, heaven forbid. We already see that all of the filler and the greatest of in history come from women. Hannah was a woman, we pray like Hannah. 
Sarah's had the greatest affiliant of Jewish history, so don't listen to those people that say such foolish things. The fact that a woman does not have to pray in a minyan means she doesn't need to, and her prayer is like that which came before. That's the obvious conclusion. What is the better prayer? The individual. That's the way it always was. We went down, we got to pray with a minyan. Minyan isn't because, oh, it was so fantastic, we get together with 10 men. The answer is, no, no, that's not good. The fact you need a minion means you're not in such a great place. It shows the individual has been lost. But that power still stands with a woman. Okay? Having said that, having said that, communal prayer does still have a power. And that's what the Rambam says. And he says, today, tefillat hatzibor nishmat tamid. Communal prayer is always heard. When you get together in a tefillah group, whether it's a group of people praying together, or a minyan for a man, or for men, I should say, prayer is always heard. Does that mean individual prayer is not always heard? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe individual prayer is heard great in the communal prayer, but there's no guarantees with individual prayer. There are guarantees, or more guarantees, with communal prayer. That's what he says. Says the Rambam, Even if you have among you sinners, every single minion, every single shul has sinners. Their prayers are not generally listened to. Don't worry. They can hide among the community. They can sneak in and they aren't listened to. They are, they are not. Are. They sneak in. We learn this, actually, from a very interesting place. From the Ketoret. The Ketoret were the amazing spices that were offered in the Beit HaMikdash. They were mixed by a family called the Avtinas family, and the smell was amazing. And each one of these, we're not too sure exactly what they were today, we know what some of them were, cinnamon and other things, but we do know that there was one spice among the Ketoret that stank. It was like when you burnt it, it was the most, dis- it like smelled like garbage. It was called the Chelbana. The Chelbana. And it was part of the 11 spices that were added to the Ketoret. Now the Ketoret smelled amazing. So what happened to the smell of the Chelbana? This one really bad, stinky, Spice. Well, when you added this one to the others, the bad smell was lost. The bad smell was lost, and it was infiltrated and overtaken by the good smell of the other spices. You would turn around and say, then why do they add it? If you can't smell the chelbana, this terrible smell, why have it in the first place? It's a fair question, I believe. Right? If you can't even smell it, and the bad smell goes, and the Chachamim and the Gemara give a very important, and I don't know, but maybe halach ruling, but it's a reality. We learn from the Ketoret that was brought to the Beit HaMikdash, the incense, that every single communal prayer must include someone who's a Chalbana person, who stinks. Hashem wants those to fill us as well. He can't take them individually, because the smell's too bad. But I want those bad people to pray. Say, Mepharashim, take that chelvana, take that smelly person, as it were, that person that's full of chata'im, and they should be added to the good. I can't smell them anymore. You don't want to smell them. You want to smell the good incense, the good spices. And therefore, they are blended with everyone else. And we learn from here, and the Gemara says this. I actually wrote an entire essay on the Ketoret, or one of the Yeshiva University books that came out. It's a very deep part. Actually, it's included in the tefillot. Right? Some people say it every single day. Right? Other people just say it especially on Shabbat. But this Ketoret is a very special part, specifically if people who want to make money. The Ketoret was a bracha for parnasa. If you want to make money, say the Ketoret daily, if not at least on Shabbat. Right? The Ashkenazim only say it on Shabbat. And Nusach Sfarad as well, I believe. Ashkenazim, uh, Sfarad said every single day, because, you know, we like money. 
And, um, right, but if you want to make parnasa, you read these ketorah together, it was segula for parnasa. So we don't have the ketorah anymore, just by reading it, because our lips take the place of the korban, by reading it, you get the same effect as though it's being burnt, as though you're burning the incense. So look out for that. It is said three times on Shabbat, twice in Shacharit, and once right before Mincha. You want to make money? Or in your cases, you want your parents to make money because they're supporting you? Say the Korbanot three times, the Ketorah three times on, on Shabbat. Yeah. Do you have in no. Another, that's another tefillah. Chance much later. This is in the Torah. This is a parasha of the Torah which gives a sugula for Paranasa. It's a sugula for Paranasa. Okay? Alright, so that's the Chelbana concept. That's the Chelbana. Which is related to the Ketoret. Right. It's the Chelbana and the Ketoret that we want to sow their bad, be their Chataim, says the Rambam. Hashem wants to hear from them. If they pray alone, that smells so good. The Tefillahs don't have the right effect, so include them in every single Tefillah, Masava Rasha. I'm not suggesting you walk around your synagogue saying, Are you a Rasha? Are you a Rasha? Right? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Minion, here we go. Have a Rasha over here. We have a. We're going to assume that everyone's got a little bit of stinky actions in their lives. I know I have. So he says, mm-hmm. Hashem is not disgusted by the fillet of bad people. Like one minute they're doing sins, and then they are in Beth Knesset. Don't worry. If you're part of the minyan, you get in under cover. You're under cover. Shel Rabim, right? The communal aspect to it is going to cover over for the Chataim. Lefikach, therefore, Sarach Adam You want to pray with a community, and therefore, even women, if they're able to, on certain chagim and on Shanyom Kippur, will join the minyan and will pray together with the community. These are certain times of the year. Where even women will try, if they're possible, to become. If they're possible, if they have a child or they're able to, they pray alone, okay, and they're in the community, right? They're not living by themselves. They're, not, they're, part, they're still part of the kehila, if not the sibor at this point. Okay? He says, that's why the loyf palal biyachid. He says, we should not pray alone. Cause man shiachol if you're in a if you're able to pray with a sibor. Your bad actions are overlooked when you kind of sneak in to the, to the community. Yeah? We're going to talk more about this later on. I'll have a, a separate paper. We'll go through the obligations of women, when to pray, because the obligations of women and men praying are we're already seeing uh, different from the times of Ezra and the Anshay Knesset Yeah. Individual aren't necessarily heard. Aren't necessarily heard. They could be, but we're, we're not, we're, we're, where there's a less of a guarantee by an individual prayer. We're going to get to that. We said women do not have the obligation, therefore there must be some dispensation. But at some times of year we still get together. Okay. So how about language? How about language? Are you allowed to pray in any language that you want? This is a very, very famous discussion of the Chachamim. It's not so simple to say yes. It's not so simple. No, it has to be a word. It should be spoken out. Spoken word, but does that spoken word have to be in Hebrew, Gabby? No, absolutely not. It's an individual thing, or it could be communal. Communal. Chazal. Communal. 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 Are we, when the unshaken at the set up prayer, did they make a stipulation that this prayer should be in Hebrew? Now remember, they came along, they came along to fix the problem of people forgetting Hebrew. So we're going to assume, just from that, that they want us praying in Hebrew. And we're going to see that the best way to pray is in Lashon Kodesh. That doesn't mean that they can't daven. I didn't say that. I did not say that. I didn't say that you cannot, that you cannot govern. We're saying the optimal way to do it 
is in Hebrew. And we're going to see why. There's reasons why. But Lashon Kodesh is the best way to pray. Okay? That's, that's for sure. Okay? Having said that, the Mishnah says in Sota, Elu Namrin Bechol Certain things you can say in any language. Tefillah. He gives a list and Tefillah is one of them. So the Mishnah, the Mishnah, which is written by the Tanaim, the great son, they were accepting that you can pray in any language you want. Language, any, in, in any la- prayer in any language is going to work. It works. It's allowed to be done. That does not mean it's the best way to do it. Right? You're allowed to come to class a few minutes late. Doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. Right? A B is a passing grade. Doesn't mean you can't get an A. Especially in my class. After all this. So let's have a look. And we'll see it's not so simple. Although it's allowed, it's not so simple when, where. And we're also going to make a differentiation between individual prayer and communal. And then we're going to, go, we're going to run right through history. Mishnah, Gemara, Rambam, Rishon, Mahronim. But we're going to end up in modern day language, modern day history with Rav Moshe Feinstein, who is basically going to say, since we are we are in history, you've got to just read the English or the French or the Russian. One thing I will say right now, which is for sure, when it says you can pray in a language, it means you must understand the language you're praying in. I don't speak French. I cannot pray in French. I couldn't just read this prayer. You must understand the language you're praying in. Now that makes sense based on what we said before, if you remember, that prayer is meant to influence you. Your own language does influence you. Right? We said when you pray, you must pray loud enough that you hear it. Your own language does influence you. But praying language you don't understand does not work except Hebrew. Hebrew, we're going to see, is so deep and there's so much put into it, it's like a computer program that I don't understand where I'm typing in all these letters, but it just gets the job done. So once again, we're going to see you can pray in language. It's not the best thing to do. If you cannot, we're going to jump to the end. We'll see what Moshe says. You can pray in any language you want. Open the door. You must understand that language because it's got to influence you. But Hebrew is the exception because Hebrew is a language that is so full of richness and spirituality that just reading the Hebrew, maybe not the best way, best way is to read the Hebrew and understand the Hebrew. I hear. But Hebrew itself, just reading the Shemona Esrei in Hebrew, the Nevi'im, the Anshak Gadola, Ezra knew what they were doing. They packed it with all the necessary formulas that need to happen for you to get what you need and we as a nation to get what we need. Okay? Okay, let's see the Gemara on this. So let's break this down. And we'll finish with this subject today. Yeah, we'll finish with a motion on the next page. Says the Gemara, or to feel of a whole lotion, may a person pray a pray in a language. Vama Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Huda says, Leolam, whatever you do, Ali Shalatam Sarahab, Veloshan Aramit. A person should not pray for his needs in Aramaic. Why? Dama Rabbi Yochanan, Kalashal Sarahab, Veloshan Arami, Emra Sharat, Niskokin La. The ministering angels don't pay attention to anyone who prays in Aramaic okay, because they don't understand it. Wow, what's that? The Malachim, the angels, who are going to somehow assist our supplications getting to the right place at the right time, don't know Aramaic, but they know Hebrew. They're Israeli. Right? Ah, oh, for one second. We still said that a person praying in any language. This is not a contradiction. One replies to the individual and the other to communal. In communal, when you're together with a communal prayer, then, then you can get away with another language because the power of the community is going to get it through. But as an individual, there's some kind of assistance you need and before Hashem and preferably individually, if a person prays to Hashem, they should do so in Hebrew. Okay, we haven't finished yet. We just work. That's the Gemara. We're going to work this through. Are you clear so far? So let's just do maybe like a uh, hierarchy of 
the way it should be done. Okay? The way it should be done. The best way to pray is in Hebrew. That's number one. Right? Hebrew is the best way. Since the time of the Hagadola with Minyan, with the community. That's the best way. Right? With community, and community is an Ada, right? It's Sibor, and that is 10 males over the age of 13. Okay? So that is the general law. After that, we're seeing so far, we're going to be like, okay, so you can pray in another language. You know, I'll add over here that Hebrew, without understanding it, is still better. Okay, that's like 1B, if you will, you know? That's 1B. Without understanding it, that's still better because the Chacham we're going to see set up Hebrew as a great language, and that's the language of the filler, language of God. Oh, one second. The Mishnah says you can pray in any language. That's true. That's true. But if you do, you want to be part of the community. It's other language, you be part of the community. Right? Right? When you pray with Sibor, right? Because they will pray. But if you do that, because communal prayer is powerful enough to get to fill up right through. But as an individual, at this point, we are saying, we've got to change it up a little bit. But at this point, it's better to be in Hebrew. Why? Because whatever it means, angels are transporting prayers to the individual. You know, the community is helping you by yourself. They don't understand. They don't know what they're reading. For some reason, they've got to understand what they're transporting. Don't ask me why. I'm not a Kabbalist. But whatever it is. So that should be in Hebrew. So that's where we are right now. Okay? And the Rambam concurs with this. Says the Rambam, it is preferable to pray in Hebrew when praying individually. But In which circumstance may one pray in any language? Right? That's, that's uh, when, I, when I want to pray in a language. Aval be yachid, but individual. Yishtadel, you should attempt, you should try. Ma'od, shaloi palel, la shem el abaloshan ha'ivri. You should speak in Hebrew. As an individual, you should try to do in Hebrew. But what happens if a person wants to pray alone and they don't know Hebrew? So let's jump forward now. So we've gone to the Rambam. Rishon, let's go to the Shulchan Aruch from Yosef Karo. And he says you can pray the standard Jewish prayers in any language. It's going to work. Okay? So we've moved from the Gemara down to the Rambam, who goes with this Pesach, and the Shulchan Aruch is going to disagree, he's going to disagree and going to open it up for the rest of us. Right? That's in his days. That's like, what, 600 years ago he was already dealing with this problem. He says you can pray in any language that you wish. And this is in a congregation. We're praying alone. You should only pray in Hebrew. There are those, the Yesh Omrim, right? The Yesh Omrim, that when a person is asking for their needs, when he's praying on behalf of a sick person or some kind of trouble in their home, in their household, that he has, when praying for the community, but praying alone, he can recite any language. So things changed. Why they changed, I don't know. But the the Shulchan Aruch already paskins, and we follow the Shulchan Aruch, <coughs> and says, this still applies, we're not getting rid of this. Prayer in Hebrew, with the community, with the Minyan, he best thing. If you don't know, do it in English. If you can, try to be part of the community. Let's say, however, you're stuck, right? And you've got some problem in your home, some struggle, some difficulty, says the Shulchan Aruch, very clearly, you can pray in any language by yourself. It's going to work. Okay. That's going to work. So, does it work? Is it good? So, the Rabbeinu Asher says, the Yesh Oimrim, the Af Yach Gishol Sarachav Yachol Yishol Bechol Hashan Shiritzeh. Even an individual who's praying alone, asking for their needs, can ask in any single language they desire. Okay? And that is how we pass it today. And that's why you say, Oh, Hashem, can you, oh, can you just help me do well in this exam? Right? If I miss classes, make sure Hashem doesn't realize, whatever you need to pray for, you can pray for. 
pray in any language. Okay? However, says the Mishnah Brura, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, the best way to do it is in Hebrew. It still is. You should try very, very hard, okay, to learn how to read Hebrew. It doesn't mean your personal prayer should be, you can read from the Siddur. That gets the job done. Okay? And that's how most people do it, by the way. We follow the Siddur, and then, here's a little clue, the best time to pray for your personal prayer, I heard this from Adam Gadol, the best time to put your personal prayers in is at the end of the Amidah, before you take three steps back. That is the best time to make your personal requests. And if you're a woman, you like Shabbat candles as well. There are certain et ratzon, right? Before you take three steps back, you finish the communal prayer, you read Hebrew, then you make your personal prayers in a language you understand, right? You do it in French, you do it in Russian, you do it in English, any language you understand. That is the best time to ask your personal requests at the end of the Amida, before you take your three steps back after Elokai Notzar, finish. That is the best time for personal tefillah. Says the Mishnah Bura, the best way to do the mitzvah is in Hebrew. We can't, that's not going to change. This permission to pray in any language, this should not become a permanent thing in your life. You should try to learn how to read Hebrew in order to pray the tefillah as they're set. Okay? Make it as a permanent thing to set up a prayer leader to pray in another language and forget Hebrew to be forgotten, that's unacceptable. Okay, so it's a community, it would work praying another language. If everyone gets together and prays in English or French, it works. But he says, don't do it on a permanent basis. Try to learn Hebrew. The Chachamim knew what they were doing. The Anshe Kinesh Gadolim knew what they were doing. You've got to try to follow the Hebrew words there as well. Okay? I'll just jump and then we'll just go back. What time is it? Okay, so give me, let's give me five minutes, we'll finish, I promise. Let's just do Rav Moshe Feinstein, then we'll jump back and look at why Hebrew is so special. So Rav Moshe, now we've jumped right through history. We did the Torah, we did the Mishnah, we did the Gemara, we did the Rishonim, we did the Achronim, we did modern day, we did uh, uh, the Mishnah Brura, right? Right? Now the Rav Moshe Feinstein. And he paskins on this, and he says, until a person learns Hebrew, he should pray in his vernacular, his language, from an authentic translation of the Siddur. Right? You can't just pick any up Siddur. You've got to pick a good one. Not all translate. Just because they're in your language doesn't mean they're good. He says, Read in English. He's answering a question, can I pray in English? He says, yes, you can. And it works, and you pray in English. Right? That means you're reading the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, you read your Amida in English. Okay? You could do it, Shinit Fasu, which is printed in a printed version. The Toblim Sot Targum Langlit, it is a good idea to find a translation that is made, Mima Shi Targem, Mishadel, Le Shomer Tomisvot, the Yoter. You should try to read from a Siddur that is written by a person who shows Torah Mitzvah that knows what they're doing. The, the English you read is important, and where, who wrote it is important as well. Just like the Hebrew is important because it's written by Chachamim, even the English you read should be read from a person that's got Yerushamayim, and should be prayed and through a proper translation. Okay? There's a long piece over here, which I'm not going to go through right now. I'll just mention it. This idea of Hebrew this idea of Hebrew being the best language is a famous idea extrapolated by Rav Dov Be'er, the Magad of Mezrich. And he says that the Hebrew letters are not just another language. Hebrew is not another language. It's Lashon Kodesh. It's the holy language. Hashem created the world using the Hebrew letters. As we say very famously, God created heavens and earth. Et is an extra word. Et. Hashemai Bet Aretz are the letters Aleph and Taf, the first letter and the last letter, which means Hashem created the world using the letters Aleph through Taf. These are, there's some mystical relationship that Kabbalah speaks about, that the Hebrew letters have a power in and of themselves. So even if you don't understand 
Hebrew just gets the job done. That's why the Chachamim put it in Hebrew and said, try to use it because everything you need for your supplications is implanted. The letters themselves are kadosh. They are holy. And when they're put together by people who know what they're doing, by prophets and the, and the Chazal, it has even great efficiency. Don't think, oh, prayer nowadays is rabbinic and therefore it doesn't mean anything. That's a big mistake to make. The greatest prayer we have is the Amida, the silent prayer, the Lachash. That prayer is written by the Ashley Gadassi Gadola. They knew what they were doing. When they, when they wrote those 18, then added that 19th, as we'll see, and why they did that, we'll see. This is the best way to fill up should be read, right? Because as we said, the Aleph Taf is the language Hashem created the world with. If Hebrew creates the world, then when we pray in Hebrew, it's going to create worlds as well. Okay? Dayeno. Stop over there. I'll see you, God willing, on Monday. There will be class on Monday.